Mr. Roger Johnson. I'm standing in for David Morris, our chairman, who can't be with us this afternoon. And this afternoon is really by way of a celebration of one of the CCS's working parties. Uh, indeed, it's rumoured that it was actually the first uh, official CCS working party. And this was on the Elliott 401. And I'm very happy that this afternoon we have two of the stalwarts of that working party to tell us about its work and so that we can relive with them the restoration of the machine. Uh, so I think the running order is Rod Brown will start off uh, to be followed by uh, Chris and then we will uh, have Rod uh, finishing up. So uh, the Elliot 401, Rod, please. The Elliot 401. Yeah. Have we got the necessary bits turned on? Yes, we have. Thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, the Elliot 401. Um, first of all, to explain that this presentation was prompted together rather rapidly. Um, it will be delivered seamlessly apart from the joins that you can see through the glue, <laughs> through the paper that joins it together, so please bear with us. Uh, we've split it up as follows. I'm basically going to do an introduction based on the time and lagging to this presentation slides for 2011, slightly updated, uh, to give you a background of Elliot's the company, rather than Elliot's the computer. Chris will then take us through the 401, which is the project in D. Um, and I will finish off with what we planned to do with 401 and what actually happened. So there should be a little bit of a, a light-hearted approach. But let's start with the true reality, the early days of Elliot's in question. Um, so, Elliot Brothers, London Limited they called themselves. This is the Lewisham factory in 1900. It's alongside the railway line in and out of London. But there's a trading history and the trading history goes back to 1804, when one William Elliot, an instrument maker in Tashbury, crazy in London, was making drawing instruments. And the company traded all the way up to 1900, when they filmed in their factory in London. Uh, this black trapezoid building, by the way, whoops, it is. This black trapezoid building was put up by the Admiralty and it was put up for, quote, special purposes. <laughs> what it actually contained was file control testing systems. And file control in those days were electromechanical analog computers which tried to take the role of the ship away and actually uh, to insert the guns in the right place. And as we all know, we have <coughs> problems used to, to the armament situation. If you throw enough shells into the same square mile, you might hit something. <laughs> so this is what they were trying to do. These file control systems were purely electromechanical, and these were the mainstay of the company's product lines for government. Here we see some systems on the testing area floor. They're big, they're bulky, they're heavy, but they have to survive because these are going to war, no less. When installed on board a ship, it's very cramped, but they've still got to survive. They've still got to get there. However, at the close of the war, and it's are in trouble. With every other company, suddenly the work has died out. There's a lack of, of confidence in senior management. Training at a loss as a company, and they're down to just 800 employees. But the most important thing is they have no electronic skills at all. In a very short period of time, this company turned itself around. We need to see why. And here we see the main members of the company at that time. One Leon Bagrit, who features heavily, and a lot of it is down to Leon. And at his side, we have Dr. Lawrence Ross. This was Leon Bagrit's technical director. He was a very able mechanical engineer, no electronics. We joined Liam when Liam started a company called BP Swift, which was just part of Liam Bagrit's empire of companies. And to the right, we have one Edgar Hertzfeld. He's a financial partner of Liam's. 
and it features between 1947 and 1968, so it covers the most important times in this country. And at the very bottom, somebody who you think is quite minor until you realise his role. This is John Coles, and he comes in from the ex Admiralty Radar Research Team and brings in those very important foundations of electronic skills. He moved into Elliott's and he stayed to, from 1946, the point where things started to turn around, and he stayed literally just before things started. But what I would like to read you is just a few facts about the Bagrick, which I was unaware of before I started this. He was born in Russia. He studied at Birkbeck College in London University and started with a small company in 1935. For many years he headed around and actually began the firm of Elliott Automation Limited, which outside the United States was the largest computer manufacturer in the world in those days. That's quite an accolade. He was a member of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, the Council of Technology, he was the director of the Royal Opera House, well done. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a brief lecturer in 1964. So, quite a person. Ian Bagrick was also a great innovator, who in 1947, now Sir Leon Bagrick, acquired control of Elliot Brothers Limited. So this is where it all starts to join up. And in 1958, Elliot and Associated Automation Limited were formed to produce Elliot Automation. His company pioneered the use of computers in the industry and made the word automation definitely a household word. But what surprised me is when I started digging into this was the book written by Leo Magritte in 1966, and I'm going to stress 1966, and I'll quote one or two items from him. It is now possible to envisage personal computers small enough to be taken around in one's car in 1966, or even in one's pocket. Yes, he was seeing ahead. They could be plugged into a national computer grid. Possibly worldwide. Possibly connected to an information system. This man was thinking. Perhaps the most far-reaching use of this new generation of computers will be in the retention and communication and information of all sites of information, possibly worldwide. He really was thinking ahead, wasn't he? In many industrial and commercial applications, we are moving steadily away from large, centralized computers towards much simpler, decentralized units. Systems which are small, cheap, special purpose, rather like building blocks. Did he foresee the personal computer? Obviously, he was thinking of it. It was this last line that really made me think about the man. Car drivers could be told immediately about traffic holdups. <laughs> and certainly rerouted and given alternate routes. In 66, well done, Lynn. <laughs> so that's a quick idea in the kind of people you're driving with. But the company actually now needed the tools to reform from those mechanicals to the inside. So let's look at how that happened. First of all, the machine shops are just large mechanical machine shops, no electronics at all. What are they turning out? They're actually turning out components. The airframe industry. And remember, the airframe industry in 1946 is most of the ex-World War designs. And I believe that to be a Lancaster. Does any of you aviation guys agree? <laughs> no, it's, it's big it enough and ugly enough and it's got the turrets in the right place. But the so engine is the wrong shape. <laughs> uh, but obviously, there was obviously a need for this. But basically, they turned out pumps and control valves, which is their main product line. Very mechanical devices. That's a typical advert. This, we do not know the name of the power station, but it's a typical power station control room. I mean, you can imagine the number of valves, <coughs> pumps, and other ancillaries that were driven off of that, those control panels, it would run into hundreds, if not thousands of them. So you, there was a business here. Because of the connection back to the airframes, I'll jump forward in time before I jump back, because aircraft and mainframes provides a little twist in fate in their fortunes. Does anybody recognize the comment? <laughs> okay. In the twist of fate, the newer aircraft designs would in turn involve Elliot's computers 
but not in a control situation, a problem solving one. Because the de Havilland Company, uh, around 1958, had two comets which literally fell out of the sky, crushing vessels, studied the wreckage and resolved the problem down to metal fatigue and further investigation, traced it down to problems around the corners and square windows just above the wing roots. Very interesting. Peter Hunt of de Havilland Company was an early outside user in 1953 of the Elliott and Nicholas computers that had just started. Using the machine, he used a 10 by 10 matrix for floating point numbers, and he checked the flutter calculations on the wings of the original comet designs. Now they had a problem with this falling out of the sky. What did they have available at the time? This in turn caused them to suggest that Elliott don't need computer time to solve it. This is now a national crisis. And of course, the NRDC had been funding something called the 401 computer. So our story starts to come together. In a letter to Peter Hunt, the Elliott Company were very keen to assist and provided months, if not almost years, of preparation to make that happen. This transpired to be one way forward, but we need to see how they got there. What they did is they brought in a person who had specialised skills in radar. And the kind of radar that they were involved with the MR55 units, big, bulky, and horribly. What they were very good at was innovating. And their aerial designs, over and above that basic one, was to take a square aerial and produce four tiny aerials within the plate. They did this for a reason. Because now you can have up, down, left, right, and right, <coughs> by comparing the magnitude of the four signals back from one radar balance. So they were starting to innovate. And what we see is work continuing on the radar. This one is a small type 275, as fitted to HMS Mr. Brook, and again, working from the dates of 1951. So as a company, they've now gone from mechanical through radar into computers. It's a classic route, as we all know. The development of the electronics all took place at War and Wood, and War and Wood was the first time they bolted together the 152 computer. This was an earlier time <coughs> of calculating and doing post-signal analysis on the MR55 radars. <coughs> These MR55 radars, in turn, <coughs> would drive development of parts of the 152 computer. The biggest problem with the 152 computer was all of the logic was early printed circuits on glass. And there was a problem with the etching. Basically, the balls just carried on etching when they were working. They had gone for miniature pento bounds, they had gone for glass, they thought it was safe. The rest of the world, of course, moved on to Paxilin and everybody solved the problem. <laughs> so they were experimenting. These developments led to a growing development in pulse and signal processing, and it's just what is needed for them to produce out our machine, the LF401. And it came out in their product line, as you can see, in 1953. We have two classic photos here, one with covers on and one with covers off. <laughs> and this is the machine that we recognise today. <coughs> Business growth in the UK spread up to 1964. 64 is important in the history of Elliot, because it was probably the peak of uh, what they were doing. They started out with just three factories down in the south. They were Lewisham, Borenwood, and Rochester. And as time went by, up to 64, they actually made 10 locations. Bayern, East Kilbride, Maryport, Slough, Wilston, Melbourne, <coughs> Park Royal, and even Frimley. And towards the end of it, they were driving not just 800 employees, but 22,400. They had a floor area of 4.2 million square foot production space and they were turning out a decent 4.13 million pounds in 1964. So as a company, they probably reached their peak <coughs> and that turns out to be true. Because if we now look at what happened 
we can see Leon Baker <coughs> sitting in front of one of these prize products. And I'm not quite sure if that's a 401 or a 403. So I'm purposely <coughs> left the title off. But between 46 to 52, they opened the labs. BP Swift then acquired Rochester, which is why they're there. <coughs> and the Elliott brothers start to make a modest profit, which is going to go big time, as we can see. There's marketing arrangements with NCR. Elliott Automation is formed, and in this year, Elliott Automation makes 50% of all new computers. Remember, numbers are quite small, but 50% is quite a lot. EA's profits and size of the company is at its highest point. From 64 on, we start to see the company doing the opposite. EA merges with English Electric, ICL is formed, ICL absorbs some of them, and in 88 is the end of Elliott as a trading name. So we've seen good years of earlier here. But we do see the rest of their products moving on into defense and aerospace and certainly biomark code and BIE systems. Now I trust that that is a foundation of the Elliott company to understand how they managed to produce such a range of products. Above all, we are focusing on the Elliott 401. The main thing we're trying to address today is the fact that we, as the Computer Conservation Society, started a project, possibly one, I believe anyway, one of the first projects that we put together. Today is basically the closure of that project. So Chris was heavily involved in the project throughout his time, and Chris is now going to take us through the project period. After that, I'll explain why. Towards the end of it, we didn't actually do a lot more, but we did try. Uh, but we are the CCS. Chris, you yeah. okay? Yeah. And this is where you have to watch the paper because the joints aren't too smooth. <laughs> <laughs> are you happy? Still working. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry to work for, for the uh, slight pause there. There were two disclaimers that I'd like to make before I start, rather than at the end, if I may. Um, the first one is that in my presentation, many of you will probably have seen some of the material before, because I think this is about the third or fourth <laughs> time I've gone through what is the area 401 project. However, there will be some new material, including videos. And the second disclaimer is that we are in the headquarters in London of the British Computer Society, the Chartered Institute for IT, uh, and the audio system here is pretty flaky. So when we come to the videos, you'll have to listen very carefully to the narration and soundtrack, which at home, on my computer, and indeed on the presentation, is very good. So with those disclaimers, let's get off the ground. I'm going to talk, as Rob said, about the project, the 401 restoration project itself. Now, it's worth looking at the timeline of this. Uh, before 1992, at the top right of this, there were 26 years of existence of the 401. Uh, about six, seven, eight years of that was productive work at Cambridge University and at the Rothamsted Agricultural Experimental Research Station. Uh, and the nearly 20 years, the machine was packed up and in storage at the Hayes store in Middlesex. Um, the, uh, the machine was donated to the Science Museum in 1965. So it was a long gap where it was doing nothing in storage. And then, when the Computer Conservation Society was formed in 1989, 1990 sort of time, uh, we worked on the Pegasus computer, that was actually the first project, um, but then the Enlightened Science Museum management at the time said, right, let's start another one, we'll get the Elliott 401 out of store uh, and try and restore that. And so, um, 1992, 
uh, that was brought out of school in 1993 we started work on the machine uh, and then you can see that after four years we actually moved away from South Kensington and then there was 14 or 15 years at my house in, in, in uh, North Kensington uh, of which in that 14 years about six were productive uh, and quite a lot of gaps but we'll come to that uh, in a moment. Now then, the Working Party was formed in 1992 and we, the initial job was to be indoctrinated in curatorial procedures by Doran Spade and others and uh, I seized the job of being leader and we had members, John Cooper, late John Cooper, who only was with us for about a year, Len Hewitt, Peter Holland, Morris Hill, Tony Sale were the initial members of the working party and we also immediately made contact with a set of pioneer consultants, most many of whom had been um, the designers of what I want essentially, Andrew St. Johnson, Hugh Devon, Harry Carpenter, Lawrence Clark, all ex Elliot people, Gavin Ross and Stuart Ellis at Rothamstead, who had been users of the machine, and so we made contact with these people to try to extract from them any information we needed to make a success of the conservation. Uh, so in 1992 it moved from storage, uh, and the first thing was that the Museum Conservation Department, as it was then, uh, started conserving the machine, that's to say, cleaning it, restoring parts that were perished, and, and essentially bringing it to a state where you have to use white gloves to handle it. And so, so that was really the start of the project. And at an early stage, having gone through the documentation that came with the machine, we discovered that the logic diagrams describing the logic of how it worked uh, was were incomplete. In fact, they were the original logic diagrams from about 1964, uh, and by 19, uh, 1954, I think, and by the time we got the machine, of course, it had been heavily modified at Cambridge uh, and, uh, and at Rothamsted, and we didn't actually get the logic diagrams which the maintenance engineers must have used there, and so an early task was to elucidate what the logic was actually like. And so that's quite easy, really. You just trace the wiring, don't you? Well, it was all white wires, so that's a bad start. Uh, but nevertheless, um, Pete Holland and Morris Steele tackled the job, the tedious job, of tracing the actual logic by just tracing the wiring. And that, you'll see, took nearly a decade. Not because they were very slow, but because it was a tough job. And under working party conditions, uh, it wasn't possible to be continuous. Now, the, the second thing we wanted to get started after getting the, the documentation established, essentially, uh, was to extract the information which was the magnetic drum and we assumed was what was there when the machine was finally switched off in 1965 to donate to the museum. And we felt that, you know, from a conservation society point of view, important to get that information off the drum as carefully and accurately as we could. It was interesting to see what were the initial orders that were there at that time. What were the programs that were running on the day this was off? What was the data like and so on associated with agricultural research? So we were faced with how would we get this information off the drop? Well, the answer is easy, don't you? Switch on the computer and you read the data down. Well, <laughs> we actually didn't have a computer to switch on. It was being cleaned and conserved. Uh, and in any case, we were not familiar with the way the machine worked, and our working party um, were, were not familiar with it. So we made a resolution that we will try to get this information. And by the way, there were 23 tracks on the drum, and each track held 128 words, so there's four and a half thousand bits on each track. Um, and we, we decided we'd do this by a bench process. That's to say we would not rely on the 401 computer to get the material off. We didn't want to break it, we didn't want to damage this. So we would carefully extract it with a bench process um, on, on the bench, on the, um, being using a cautious approach. 
And so there were two steps. First, we had to get the drum to rotate safely. Uh, and, and then secondly, get the signals off the drum. Once we'd got and preserved the signals off the drum, we felt that everything was safe. We could then get on with getting the machine together. Now, continuing the, the archaeology aspect, here is the drum um, as used on the 401. Originally, when it was made, it had a disc, but for some reason, and I think possibly uh, temperature instability of the disc, they changed over to a drum, and the drum is on the left-hand side of the picture, and here's a three-quarter horsepower DC motor driving it on this side. Uh, it runs at about 4,600 RPM uh, at its correct speed, and you can see around the, the drum, which is the oxide, brown oxide coated area, there's various attachments for the heads to be the data. But that's the machine we were faced with. Um, so the first thing, if you remember, get the drum rotating safely. So we approached it ever so simple, simply. Um, we, here's a picture of the logbook from March 1993. And you should be able to see in the middle of the picture here, um, the simple diagram of the circuit needs to get the drum ready. There are, there are two rectifiers fed off the mains, one to feed the armature, the other to feed the field, and the one feeding the armature at this sort of area. So we, with that, we can safely bring the drum up to speed. And there's no servo control, there's no um, uh, auto automatic um, switching system system to bring it on. It's all done manually, but it's so simple that we've got good control on what we're doing. So to illustrate this, in 1993, Tony Sale was very keen on videoing events uh, around the, um, the society and what was going on in the museum. So with a great big on the shoulder um, video camera, he actually made a recording, which I had forgotten about until uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, when uh, uh, Kevin Morrill kindly sent me a digitized version of this. So let's see whether this will work.
一個人的時代咧。So we made the machine, the, the drop rotate safely at a chosen speed. We were actually running at about half the speed that it should run uh, in the computer, uh, 4,600 is its true speed, but conservatively we were running about half that speed. And the question was, now can we recover any track signals? And secondly, can we interpret those signals as 401 data? And here is the logbook entry for August 1993 showing the proposed track capture measure method, method. Uh, on the um, left hand side the head feeds an amplifier with a gain of a thousand so that we get about five volt signals peak to peak. Uh, these were fed into an analog digital six bit converter sampled at four megahertz and all this equipment was actually built by Tony Sale at home um, and uh, we're a bit naive. We got a cast of mind back that it's 1993, and in the use of micro controllers and so on, it wasn't there. I mean, you built everything on breadboard out of standard components. A 64 kilobyte buffer, and that was limited to 64 kilobytes because MS DOS software limited it. This way it was really 64 kilobytes, so we, didn't, we couldn't handle the buttons if we did that. Then a uh, serial interface into a PC file. Uh, there was an Amiga compu computer involved in this, and I can't remember what its role was, but the program in the PC uh, was called Amigin. Um, Amigin. But the, the upshot was that actually um, produced a file of sampled analog data. Remember there were about four and a half thousand bits on a track. So one track into 64 kilobytes meant that they were sampling at around about 12 or 13 samples per bit, per any of four and one bit. Um, and and that, that file was the file six bit. Okay. Then take the file and offline in a program which I call Wave 41, there was a series of such programs. We could then display the data and attempt to make an analysis. And then what we're trying to do is turn that analog data off the drum into uh, uh, into a readable, uh, readable information. Here's the drum with one <coughs> head fitted at the top. You can see the cable coming around. We've chosen a head. We've, we've chosen a very conservative gap between the head and the drum surface. Should be about a thou, but um, we, we probably had it set out at that time to about four thousandths of an inch. As it says in the long book, a standard piece of paper was used as the as pacer, uh, and then a, the, um, that signal was then fed into the uh, circuitry in front of the oscilloscope there, the, the amplifier, and the A to D converter, and then down the ribbon, ribbon, ribbon cable into the PC, and 
here, um, Tony Sale, Len Hewitt, and myself, uh, apparently extracting uh, one of these information from one of these tracks. It wasn't easy, it wasn't quick, I should say, because each head had to be placed in position and very carefully approached to the drum without damaging it, just enough to get a reasonably noise-free signal, uh, and then make sure that the speed was such that we got a whole track into a file and not only half a track as well. So one track at a time, we could extract this information. And here, for example, is the kind of sampled signal of the drum, large and small pulses of various widths, and for each of those waves, there's about uh, 12, 12 and 13 samples. And so successfully we captured about 30 files and each held up to 64 kilobytes. Now, these were individual tracks, track samples, and there was no correlation between the clock track, the fundamental clock of the computer which derived from the track of the drum. Uh, there was no correlation between uh, the top track and the address track with the data tracks, nor with each other, because each one was done independently. There's nothing on the drum to say this is the start of the drum, uh, rotation of the tracks or whatever. So we are faced with taking that, um, we we'll must get the actual, um, create the topic and the word address from this signal um, knowing only that that's a phase one <coughs> signal which operating at um, three microsecond period. So the next step was to how do we get that off? Now we could have built uh, a decode a hardware decoding system such as is in the real Elliot 401, but do it in modern technology, but felt that was too difficult and inflexible. Um, and so decided to use a software approach. So in 1993, we were familiar with using MS-DOS, but Windows was barely on the scene, uh, and I don't think we had a copy of Windows then. Um, so wrote a series of programs in Turbo Pascal, running under MS-DOS to help with the analysis. And that turned out to be rather successful. And the, the next video I'm going to show now is how this uh, analysis program worked. This was, by this time it was WF4, uh, which gave us all we needed to, to do to turn the track information into meaningful data. Um, now, th this has got a very good loud narration over it, and I hope you'll be able to hear it in face of the bias here. This is the opening screen of the analysis program. It covers the full, full screen uh, of the old MS-DOS computer. Don't forget that the program will be entirely keyboard controlled because we didn't have the luxury of a, of a mouse at the time. So for example, uh, at the top of this screen, uh, there are various highlighted letters uh, which are the key to press in order to set the particular parameter, those are the various parameters needed during the analysis of a track. And the bottom part of the screen has other uh, controls in order to do various actions uh, on not parameterizing. The track data which we have recorded, captured uh, earlier, is now available in one file per track with a maximum of 64,000 samples. Uh, per track, depending on the speed the drums run when we captured the data. Uh, and uh, we can now load the information for a track into this tool, and we can do that by saying load um, the head address. And we can see here, therefore, the analog waveform that we captured is a little bit small there. So we'll increase the gain. Press the Y, uh, three, three times, we can more 
visible now. And you can see, therefore, the analog waveform that we captured. Uh, each of those uh, waves is, is around about 13 samples long. Uh, you can see at the top, <coughs> we top people with 13. That means we preset the tool to assume there are 13 samples uh, for a one clock pulse. Uh, that's variable and, and will, will vary depending on which track we're looking at. And in one of the parameters, it needs to be adjusted to make sure that we can pick up the data properly. Um, so here we've got 640 samples across the screen, and we can, for example, change that. We'll change it to 25 samples. And now we can see the mass of the half of the data from the track all crammed up together. Picture of the envelope and the signal on the drum. Not, not too useful at this stage of the checking that we've got a reasonable capture. Uh, so we'll go back to our Google script. Here we are. Uh, you can see not only large and small waves uh, in this uh, sample, but little anomalies here and there, including little sort of like glitches on the forward the edge of the wave. The, these, we can at least see these and see that that's actually on the drum and they can be clues to where a word starts and so on uh, in, the, in amongst the data. Now then, below the sample data is a, a red line, the so-called threshold. I'll set that to be 25. And now you can see that it's superimposed on the, the sample data. And the idea is that any, any signal on the track below the red line is zero. And anything above it is one. <coughs> better, I should say, anything below is low and anything above is high. So that we get a square wave signal, which is the squared up analog data um, just below that data and we should really move the red line so it's roughly in the middle of the sample and raise it so that the square waves down below uh, should be evenly narrow squares or wide squares with where there's a glitch and the glitch is amongst the squares and uh, We've got next to be able to take those square waves and sample them with the equivalent of the 401 clock um, to decode the data that's in there. Now, below the square wave, you can see some little tick marks, and they're set to represent the 401 clock. That, that's set by means of that clock period was 13 in the top left. Uh, of the uh, screen, uh, so, so that every 13 samples there is a tick. Now, uh, they're not lined up, they have to be lined up with the middle of the square waves, and they're not lined up at the moment, so we have to adjust their phase uh, to the uh, correct, to line up with the square waves, uh, and to do that we've got a, a, a vertical marker. And this is a timing marker. That vertical red line is a timing marker to pinpoint a particular sample uh, on this wave. It's a little bit to the right of the trough in the waveform, and I'd like it on the bottom of the trough. So we'll move it back a little bit. So that's now on the bottom of the trough, and that's where we would like to sample the square wave loss. And so we need to move those tick marks to line up with that marker. We've got key to do that. Uh, now the phase of those tick marks now starts where the marker is, and we now see that those tick marks all align nicely with the square wave above. And that then <coughs> comes to be a bit screen, 0, 0, 0, 1, etc. along the below the tick marks. And in turn, that bitstream can be analyzed by the program 
into 32-bit chunks, each of which could represent a word of the drum. And furthermore, it can format such a word into a 401 instruction. And we can see below the bit stream there, 2.125364.0.0, which looks like a plausible 401 instruction. And the 2.125 would be the address of the next instruction to be executed after this. The 3604 is the function code and source and destination registers of the instruction, and 0.0 is the address of the operand required by the instruction. So that looks like a plausible uh, instruction. And we can scroll horizontally through the data, uh, through the sample data, to see whether there are any more which are plausible. And that's 5.2. 4174.0 so on. So scroll through by that one. That one didn't look so this. And one did say something else. So we can see that one would be all one. But it might be a perfection. I don't know. But the ana analyst therefore has got a tool to sample the analog waveform, both in time uh, and in the threshold, and in the number of samples per uh, property of it in order to decode the waveform and, and in turn structure it into meaningful 401 uh, structures. Now uh, it, it, there are further uh, controls down at the bottom of the screen to print the this decoded data on the printer in various formats uh, and then we can use that. We, what, what we're aiming at is to get 128 plausible words off this track, and we can print that and then analyze separately to find which words, which are the words which start the track and so on, separately from this analysis. I'm sorry to have made you do all that so tediously. Um, the, the effect is that we we can now extract. Um, tables of the data on the drum, and I've skipped over all the clever stuff about determining where the word boundaries and so on are. Uh, but <coughs> here is the um, head two, track two, uh, with uh, the sequence of 128 locations on the track, left hand sides, north down to 29, and so on, several pages of this. And the analyst by hand would go through. Uh, assuming that he's made a judgment that it's instructions and not data, um, it actually looks as though it's a data track by the numbers on the right hand side. And he would go through looking for clues about where the, the words on the track start. Um, and uh, a way of doing that is to look at the next address field of instructions uh, and looking for early ones. So, for example, uh, location one uh, uh, on this particular track um, has got 0.0, .0 as the next address. Um, and you would say, oh, well, that's probably beginning at the beginning of the track on the drum. Well, in fact, those are not instructions, because they all say that that's the next instruction. But by doing this kind of analysis of the uh, location of words on this track, which we haven't yet oriented to be correctly synchronized with the, uh, the uh, start of the track. Uh, we can then go further with the analysis. And here is the beginning of track 23, one we were looking at earlier. Uh, and this is now plausible instructions, uh, and indeed part of the initial orders. Uh, it's not complete at this like, stage, but you can see that uh, the first instruction, north north, says that the next instruction is at 0 0.2, and the next one's at 0 0.4, and so on and so forth. Uh, so by you could build up the uh, pattern of the, um, instructions within this program, and where each word is, um, and deduce from that 
from the beginning of the project, uh, way in the beginning of the tractors. So by all this laborious manual and semi-automatic tooled uh, work, uh, we end up with the information on the drums, on, on the tracks. And this, this, this analysis <coughs> continued on and off for another 10 years with the contributions of Alan Martin, one of our volunteers, and Gavin Ross uh, at Graf Rotham State. So that now uh, we have an authoritative version of the initial orders as they were in 1965. Now, armed with that, then, when, as we made the work, uh, we could, uh, obviously, at some stage, um, we were able to run the initial orders and then run real programs. So that was part of the, uh, the route we were taking to get the whole machine working. And I've characterised that, all that work, as drum archaeology. We were actually extracting concealed information uh, it, it, from, from the old days for uh, our own use. Um, now that's the, all this work I've just been describing of the initial analysis track, rescue and so on, has been going on until about 1994 when we had a radical change in the working environment. The decision was that the machine which had been in uh, the old canteen at the Science Museum where we've been doing the work where the drum archaeology and the machine conservation and so on had been going on. Uh, the decision was that was going to be closed down and the machine would be moved to the Blythe House store in North Kensington. Um, so we stopped all the work that we could do and the machine was transported to Blythe Road and placed in room F36. The room was too small for us to actually do any significant work, except that the um, logic, that the, the logic elucidation by tracing the wiring could more or less just be done using torches and patching around the machine, but it was very unsatisfactory. And so the decision was made that no, we couldn't actually do the conservation in room F36. So Lawrence Wade. Uh, was able to earmark room F48, a much bigger room, for our work, and we uh, had to then prepare the false floor and the electrical services and so on, and it took several years in order to do that. Um, and then finally, we were able to move the machine down from F36 down into F48 in 1996, and we had a, as it were, a two year holiday, uh, not being able to do anything significant. Here is the characteristic appearance of Blythe House, Blythe House. Uh, tiled walls for the corridors, quite lofty, big windows, uh, nice polished floors, and so on. And inside the room, we'd lay down this false floor, um, put in the electrical services, uh, block the windows uh, so that uh, it was clean. Um, and there you can see down the middle of the floor the plinth on which the cabinet stands and we're all gazing at that with wonder where are we going to go next? Well, the next thing to do was to assemble the cabinets onto the plinth and there are mostly uh, museum object handlers doing that. And I notice only some of them have got white gloves on but it depends on the training. And uh, there it was assembled and again we rest and look and see uh, well we've achieved something. We've assembled the main machine in place where we're going to conserve it. I always think of this as um, bringing back the Ark of the Covenant. It's actually the drum in its box which for some reason was left at South Kensington um, and uh, it's been eventually brought up to North Kensington and put in place and, and uh, Peter Holland and Morris Hill the rear of the box were the people who had been doing the logic uh, uh, elucidation. So in 1997, we got to the point where we could start powering up. So we decided to install a three-phase variac, which was a high-powered, delightful thing, so that we could cautiously revive the power supply system uh, in the machine. Um, 
and had a little bit of trouble in getting that to work actually because every time he switched on this pretty phase area the miniature circuit breaker outside in the corridor always tripped on the new 16 amp one and so we had, a, had to solve that problem um, and um, the, 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 this very point there was a prolonged hiatus when we didn't do much work apart from elucidating the logic of the wiring um, with very little commissioning work being done on the machine due to a change in priorities this was partly that the early um, 401 project leader was called away uh, to do the Manchester Navy replica. Unfortunately, got it away. And so it was very intermittent. Um, but the logic tracing went on through this time. Um, and by 2003, uh, Arthur Roberts, who had been an employee of the museum in the audiovisual department, I think, um, accepted leadership of the working party, taking over from me, releasing me to do other things. And um, that started a good, good system. By April 2004, the working party reformed and started meeting picking up on the earlier plans and the task scripts which we developed uh, in the previous period of work. We, we've, got a, we've got a process that for every task that had to be done, like uh, get the power supplies working, we would build up a script of sub-tasks which had to be done and tests which had to be done so that we didn't just go bullet a gate and switch on, sort of hope for the best. We had a systematic way of tackling each little problem. And these were scripted, and we all knew that these scripts should do the task. They were safe, they weren't going to do damage to the machine, and, and so on. So those were all sort of lying on the table, ready to take forward uh, when the working party restarted. Um, and the power supply system, the control system for the power supply system, was surprisingly hard to get working. Now, it, it always impresses me that the pioneers were able to get that machine built and working and did, demonstrated the Physical Society exhibition in April 1953. And yet here, with all our experience and knowledge that over the years, it was hard to get it to work properly. The power supply system was quite complicated with all sorts of interlocks that the doors got to be closed. And, power's got to be right in that cabinet before you can do that. So, so it's quite a complicated control system. Um, and there were, everything was joined together with little paint and plugs and sockets in the pit. So this cabinet was plugged into the pit, so there's that there was a long chain of interlocks through all this. And after 25 years in storage at the hay store, uh, on and messing it about, carrying it to the back into the then up to here. The problems with plugs and sockets were quite severe, and you'd spend a lot of time tracing the wire and, and waggling it. Oh, that's good, that's going right. I wonder what it was. Next week you come in and it's the same again. There you go. Do you remember to look at the same problem? So there was a lot of intermittencies of that sort, which actually plagued us for the whole time. Um, by 2005, we had got the power supply system going, and we were able, ready to make the drum system. We wanted to get the drum system working with its proper logic associated with it because that supplied the clock pulses and the address tracks, the timer pulses needed by the rest of the machine. Uh, it was quite an important quality. And that was what we got on. And here is part of the working party at that time. You can see Peter Lawrence, the monster comes on and he's with us in the middle of the audience. Peter Holland coming round to the front, the drum in its cabinet at the end here, Arthur Rolls there, someone else at the back, I can't remember who that was, uh, trying to get him in position to do it. So the, from then on, from 2005 onwards, the working party was meeting regularly every two weeks, in a big long now, I remember. And we've got the logbook, and we've had the logbook um, and photocopied in PDF, 
and it is a real experience to work through the pages of our book. Fortnight after fortnight, the working party met, we were working on this, and we couldn't establish what was different from the last time that it seemed to work and so on. And, and the dogged continuing to work, to get the thing working, according to the script, um, was, was moving forward with, with this regular set of working days. Um, when it did work, when the drum did work, particularly much sort of thing that might happen is the drum pro provides the clock pulses for the main computer, 333.3 kilohertz. Um, to do that, the drum is synchronized with the timing source to make sure it stays at the right speed, 4656 RPM. Um, now, there's a fairly complicated servo system which controls the field current and the armature current in the drum to maintain that speed. One thing about a drum is it's a very good flywheel, so once you've got the speed right, it's quite hard to push it off to a different speed. However, that servo system was very problematic, and you get it perfectly working, spot on the speed. John Harper's strobe scope and could read the speed of it. Um, and then an hour later, it suddenly dropped off to a third of the speed, just some other speed. And you go and look at it, and it would come back. And try to find this, the, where the unreliability was with a, a, a complicated servo system. It was very difficult. So it, when it worked on a good day, it was fine. You could have got timing pulses, and you could commission the rest of the machine and move forward. But when you do, you have to go back and get the drum working again. But over and, and over a decade of patient work by Lawrence and Peter Holland, we finally elucidated the correct logic diagrams, so we could start commissioning the machine properly. Um, and we did have some success getting the monitoring of it through the category. That was the unit which we the picture of it. The monitoring unit on the right hand side and we had two screens and all those push buttons down the middle, uh, you could see what are in the register and shop address and that. All sorts of useful information. Provided the connections from those push buttons down the cables and into the plate and up into the cabinets were reliable through all the function buttons, and they often were not. Uh, but in principle that was the way you handle it. And you'll see rows of hand switches in the middle of that cabinet, which is the way you put manual instructions and manual data into the um, uh, machine, and uh, those have specialised electronics with delay lines with many coils on to, to do the number generating, and one of those was broken and almost unmendable. So we had all sorts of problems trying to get that to work, but nevertheless it was beginning to work sufficiently uh, to make progress. Uh, and the other cabinet is the input output operator cabinet with a big hole in the top where the typewriter should be that you got it. And the little bit on the top of the side is the tape reader. So uh, the monitor unit we got going. And we, by 2008, success was on the horizon. By, by perseverance of these two weekly meetings, Played with dodgy connections, puzzling circuit design, document discrepancies, etc., we were beginning to show results. And indeed, um, the initial orders on modern track zero could regularly be downloaded, um, although the drum persisted being unreliable. But you know, on a good day, you could get the download of the initial orders. And it was now possible to attempt to make individual orders operate within the control logic. And for example, I noted in the logbook that one of the orders in the initial orders was to read the next character from the paper tape reader, uh, which we just saw was on top of the operator's cabinet. And uh, the logbook notes that um, uh, this, they, they traced the signal to the paper tape reader it, that had attempted to read something but there wasn't any paper, and in any case the tech reader was uh, seized up. 
So uh, they were making good progress now um, after all these years of preliminary work on trying to get the thing commissioned. However, in uh, 2005, nine, the Bankers Institute embargo for the work. We weren't allowed to work on the machine. Um, in fact, the CCS wasn't allowed to work on any of the uh, science museums machines. Um, and the very last entry in the logbook records a visit by specialists to carry out an asbestos survey on the machine. And essentially, that was where no further work could carry on because um, um, of this embargo. So, to get that far, what is it, 1992, 1993 to 2008, it was um, 17, 18 years, uh, with, with gaps, um, a lot of effort to it. Norman, to a attorney saying, we were key to getting the project established because Donald had the power to get things out of store and authorise us to, um, to do it. And they both continued to give us support. Donald was getting room F48 refurbished and so on. He was telling me before lunch that um, he'd been told that he could have 500 pounds for making a false floor and doing the electrics. Um, and he'd had to come out of his discretionary budget but in the end, the science ministry did pay for it because it was a customer of the pocket. Uh, John Cooper, then Peter Holland, and Morris, and Arthur Gold, all these people were regular or intermittent members or leaders of the project. Uh, and many designers and users of the former world were interested in the project, especially Harry Carpenter and Gavin Ross, who gave us quite a lot of help. Um, so I think now uh, I would say that from our point of view, that was the end of doing work on the 401 project. But Rod will now complete the story by saying where do we go from here? What do you want? innovated, innovated, and innovated to keep things going. Uh, there were various things against us globally, and possibly one was the risks that the Science Museum observed. So about 2008, when Chris mentioned, I finally got involved in about 2010, and we are indeed now up to 2018. And as we've said today, today is a celebration of the closure of this project. Uh, what I'd like to do is to show the fact that as a society we again carried on innovating, trying to get the project back up. Whether or not we did is debatable, but there were three different major things we had to go forward. We still had to address the drum as a conservation unit in its own right, which Chris has specified. There was a major problem with something called the shunt regulator, which was really something I'd like to explain as to why some of these old machines were just a bit, um, <clears throat> shall we say, dangerous. And finally, because the idea had worked elsewhere, we had proposed an idea of actually regenerating the drum signals to generate our own drum. So the way forward that we saw uh, at that point in time was that um, we would actually point out the fact that we could never actually touch the drum. But what we actually needed to do was to get code into the machine. What we needed to do was provide the machine with clock, timing, address, and a single track, which I think was initial orders that we chose. We had actually done this before in another project. Everything on that drum was totally independent, so the idea was to take the drum away and replace it with a pseudo drum, an emulated drum something which again has been done by the society in the former, go in and emulate the stripes. <laughs> so in the tradition of the CCS, 
we had actually used this technique on the 1300. We only used it for about a month, but it actually solved the problem. What we had to do was to generate clock, track markers, and four lots of data at the correct wave shapes, but everything had been burnt into an EEPROM, but we had no drum. So if we follow this one as engineers for a little while, we basically have a free running oscillator which drives a counter. The counter produces a binary pattern which scans the EEPROM. The signals come flying out of the EEPROM, they're wave shaped, but the big trick because it's not a real drum is, somewhere in the EEPROM, you set the marker to say it's the end of the spin. Strangely enough, if you clear the counter, you repeat the pattern over and over and over again. You have a virtual drum. What you don't have, unfortunately, are the nice waveforms that we need to feed into the machine. So what I did is I took this proposal from the 1301, which had worked. And we would never have got the initial orders off of the 1300 project without it. Fortunately, the 401 already had a copy of its initial orders, and we adapted it. Same idea, one oscillator running, drives a counter, scans the EEPROM. In the case of the 401, we only needed to generate a maximum two lots of addresses. One address mark, hot track, and the initial orders data stream. If we could get initial orders in reliably and clock the machine reliably, we stood a chance. So thus was the proposal that actually went into the science museum that we would generate a pseudo drum. Unfortunately, we were never allowed to build it because of the hiatus of work, but we knew the idea worked. So this proposal was went forward and we actually talk them through what we wanted to do. They agreed it was a way forward, but uh, as we've said, there were other little problems. Um, what we were going to use, of course, was that recovered data that Chris, Tony Sale had actually got. So it's exactly the same. And we think it would have worked. Um, the Science Museum, in turn, had their own ideas. Um, what we really needed to do was to actually address the problems they were throwing at us. And there were shared problems, whether we liked it or not. The Science Museum was not too happy with some of the risks that were involved with cloud machines. So the last thing, binary data popping out of the EEPROM, and again, we had to emulate that drum shape. Whether or not we actually used it or not, the big target. What we did with those waveforms was to pump them into the pop app pump them into the address counter app and the data apps. Every one of those little boxes there is replicated by that valve circuit. And it's the head switching. It's the minimum interference with the machine. But one of the problems that we had, we actually shared with another machine, Simon Pegasus. It was a Pegasus. When I was reading Simon's book, I discovered that actually some of the designs that they left of it actually went and worked on the design of Pegasus. Nice to know that people were still moving forward. But there was a common feature, and that was the use of asbestos. And it's asbestos for a very good reason, because both machines use something called a shunt regulator. Sorry to take you through this, but we need to explain why these machines were considered to be dangerous. Basically, you're generating 12 kilowatts of power, arguably so about 500 volts, at 25 amps, it's a killer voltage in This is why engineers that when they worked on these machines only had one hand near the machine at any point in time. And anybody who put two hands near the machines tended not to be around for too long. <laughs> so this is the basic power supply, but I want to explain what is happening. This cabinet can demand power very, very rapidly. Even in these machines, which were valve machines, we're talking about power supplies that had to respond rapidly. So all I could do was generate 12 kilowatts. And if they didn't use 10 kilowatts, they'd need to throw it away. So there's a lot of heat produced in this dump boat. And that's where the asbestos issue came up. I can just take you through why these shunt regulators were so, so quite dangerous. So we'll look at a normal load, and perhaps 60% of the power is being in the machine, and 40% of it being thrown away. You're writing code, you're reading programs, 
the demands of the machine can change, and it can slip up to maximum. Suddenly, you're pushing 95% back down to the bottom, you're just wasting time. And alternately, even on the next instruction, it can go down to minimum. You really do have a power supply that's having to respond rapidly, and all it can do there is the same again, throw the excess into the dump over, but throwing away 60. That's a big percentage, they're high voltages, they're heavy amperages. Quite dangerous. For argument's sake, we'll say it goes back up to maximum, the figures you've just seen. And again, for argument's sake, we'll say it goes down to minimum. And then, surprise, surprise, it returns to normal. So these power supplies actually were working very, very hard. The problem that we had with not so much with Pegasus, although we were allowed to, if I remember rightly, then to change all the fuse holders and, and many of the components. The problem with the 401 was that the original elements were wound on asbestos forms. They had to go. At about the same point in time, we launched another project within our society. We had launched EDSAC. And while they were looking for valves on EDSAC, I was looking for non-asbestos fire elements <laughs> to throw the power into. <laughs> and the one thing that I started to work on was I started with, with the whole eBay. Almost everything we needed, and I think even the valves for EDSAC was a beautiful source. So at least that one was pushed to one side. So we proposed something for the drum. We thought we tied up the asbestos problem. And we were left with just one issue. And again, I'll stress innovation, innovation, whether or not we were allowed to use it is another issue. The power supply was shunt regulated, was basically put away. We had at least 12 out of the 16 elements. We knew we could move forward. It was time to go back to this old, old issue of trying to create a wave shape. And this was the last real effort that went into it. But we were still waiting for the site who's in to say yes or no, whether or not we could work on this. What we really had was, that's just the timing, a reference point. We actually had a waveform that we had to generate because we had to feed it into the 401 or the 1300. What would the machine do with that waveform? We could try and turn it back to a binary pattern. So that waveform would run in. The first thing you would do is square it up so that you start to get a chance. The next thing you would do is apply a strobe. And if you're really, really lucky, you recover the original data. The big trick was to generate that waveform. In both machines, both 1301 and 401, we actually had a friend in as much as the frequencies that were involved were pretty close. It was 250 kilohertz in the case of the 1301, and I think it was 330 or near on the 401. So what we needed was a frequency. We borrowed a trick from the radio world. The very frequencies we needed to tune to were around 430 kilohertz to actually bring those wave shapes back. There was a handy component commonly available in most transistor radios called the intermediate frequency transformer. These were all factory tuned to 455. If you took them apart, you could tweak them. <laughs> so the world of radio was changing, everything was going digital, so there were boxes and boxes of intermediate transformers available. Good old email. <laughs> The one thing that we did do when we did the 1300 version, these came in varieties of red, yellow, and white, depending upon where they were used in the super circuitry. What we quickly learned to do is when we did ours, we painted them orange. <laughs> they were ours. <laughs> when you assembled these, and we did actually turn these out to the 1300, you can see an assembly there, the amplifiers, and back-to-back -back transformers which helped you get the wave shape. What we do know is we did get the right wave shapes although that's what the sampling scope. So we were ready to go forward. But what I need to stress now is the very, very last thing was what happened next, and we really know. And it's not so much sad news so much as a change in the life of what we did. What happened next was, as we all know, the Frontier Predators project closed, the Computing and Communications Gallery was built, I think they had a CBC 600, a Besson 6, something I've never seen before in my life. And we also had a console from an IBM 360. The next thing is the papers is actually removed. Sadly enough, the baggage is removed. 
The mathematics gallery was refurbished. There's a huge central theme of early flight and airflow for those of you who have dodged around it. <laughs> but it was not the end of the story. During the latter period of the negotiations for the Science Museum, and this went on and on, as Chris himself went through, working parties, rules, structures, hierarchies, many, many times they hinted that we would not have our efforts overlooked. And between you and I, dare they actually risk it? <laughs> the other 401 as it is today, it was saved by the CCS and all of the work you, as a society, put into it. This and every project you have ever started, the CCS is about to celebrate its 30th year next year. And although this project is closing today, there are many more live projects out there. So I think there's a lesson learned from this project, which we're closing, there's a lesson learned from the other projects. Keep innovating. Computers came from innovation. Keep innovating because that is the L401, and I call it in aspect behind glass in the Science Museum today, and it's only there because of what this society did. So well done you. <laughs> Okie dokie. <laughs>
little bit of a fuzzy period. Meanwhile, the team, the, design, the people who worked on the developments, Bill Elliott particularly, got upset in his in the Elliott's set up and left initially for a period at Cambridge, then into Franti, he then became the leader on the Franti package F the FPC proposal that was made to NRDC. NRDC at the time were keen to get a production machine, but they despaired of Elliot's getting a move on. So they also they started talking to Franti and encouraged Franti on his FPC project, Bill Elliot and a number of the Elliot development engineers, uh, Charles Owen and Hugh Davenholt, and George Felton, who worked on the software, ended up on the Pegasus project. And the Franti people had a different approach to engineering of the machine than the Elliott people. They used edge connectors. The, the technology moved up on it. So it was, it was not surprising that it was a more reliable machine. But my comment was really just about the asbestos in the Science Museum and their views of it. Quite a few years ago, I was attending committee meetings in Blythe House, only because it was a place where you could get free and everyone else wanted to charge for it. <laughs> um, out of that organising conference, nothing to do with this. But we used to have tours around to look at the stuff, and there was the 2 ml transmitter in there, which uh, uh, was the first transmitter used in Chelmsford. But it had a big uh, black and yellow tape all around, and we weren't really allowed to go at all close to it because it was so dangerous. It was so dangerous because there was a little bit of asbestos ring around each of the valve pieces. And you know, it, it might jump out as you were walking <laughs> uh, I mean, That was our view of it anyway. We weren't allowed near, near it, we could just look at it. Well, um, now, it's in the Science Museum, on display for the great rich public and all others to see. Uh, it still, I think, has this little tiny bit of asbestos there, but the black and yellow tape is gone. <laughs> and um, I've asked about this, and people have told me, oh, well, it's sort of a different person in charge. Maybe that's helpful to you. That's uh, well, well we, we would have loved to have used all of those arguments, unfortunately, <coughs> everybody that was involved with these machines, and all of the effort you put in the society was very disappointing. We can see why they did it. Mm. Um, by that same token, uh, isn't it strange that um, a lot of people here have played a bit in the chemistry lab and they've, they've chased a little globule of mercury oh, across yeah. the bed and they're thinking, yeah. why aren't we dead? We did worse. Again, another piece of received wisdom in that I stuck my head into the room occasionally in Blythe House but never really got involved. Wasn't there some problem at one point with the power supply because it had luminous paint on it? <laughs> and it was going to be radioactive and deadly. <laughs> to the um, and and the, the, it was, they, they were actually you know, sort of co commercially available switches or something that glowed in the dark. But all of a sudden, <laughs> oh, there was one small the temperature gauge about it yeah. being one panel which had luminous paper gradient. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask Chris a question? The, the 401 had delay line stored. Did you ever investigate the delay line stored on the 401? The, 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 the store of the machine was actually drunk. And there were registers. There were three registers in the machine which were meant to be restricted delay lines, yes. And um, no, we barely got to that. I have to say, when you look at the museum now, you can't see any information about what the memory is. You can see it, John. There was no statement about the video or anything. It was never going to help them. Peter, what I just said, the delay lines on the 401 did work. Uh, they haven't got much way, much, much way of using them. But they, did, they did seem to work perfectly adequately. They were, they were incidentally, a revised design, not the original. But uh, they're, they're short delay lines, not too much uh, stalling at all. You, you, you've talked of emulating the drum. 
um, would it have been, is it possible to emulate the power supply? And if you go to that extent, do you get to the point where what's important about having the machine working is getting lost and therefore the project becomes uh, pointless? Yes, uh, in, in fact, what was brought home to me is we, we had Andrew here uh, in charge of the EdTech project. Now, the power supplies you've got on EdTech are rather superb so. <laughs> <laughs> and very modern. Um, but just throw us some, some scary prices for building the power supplies because I don't think the Science Museum would kind of reach out and fund it the same way as with the Edward EdTech. I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but I think there are three boxes costed at 5,000 each. <laughs> so compared to building a motor generator and a set of rooms, what the original machine had. But that modern power supply doesn't use the techniques that these you know, yeah, you've had to generate this power. responding in, in that sort of way. Though. Well, no, they're, they're probably doing it serially, I guess, aren't they? You know, you're, you're actually switching the power on on, on demand. The big difference is modern power supplies and switch mode power supplies, yep. rather than dumping current, they just produce what's needed. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, but there's a nice um, corollary to your story. The the last machine that Cambridge University's computer lab built as a single machine was the CAP. Um, it mm -hmm. slightly predated switch mode power supplies. It had a current damping supply, and the damping mechanism was precisely the um, bar out of an electric fire. Precisely. But what I was trying to load sweetly in the bottom of the machine. What I was trying to stress there, there were solutions. You, know, you couldn't find the right fit, you could find something. <laughs> you know, the, the, the other little bit about does it, it if that was done, is that would there still have been benefits in the project? Or is the drum and the power supply that sort of thing? what's important about having it restored, and therefore you lose the points of the restoration. The, the point of actually trying to emulate the drum was to inject code into the machine so you could fall flight. Uh, and all machines of this era, if they used the drum store, whether they used the cyclic delay line store, they are dynamic machines. Unless you can generate the right signals, they're not going to work. Um, one of the things that I find quite fascinating is of the period of about six or seven machines, Perhaps even in the six or seven countries, there was so much commonality in the technology at that point in time. Then suddenly we move forward to course building. Suddenly we do not need the rotating device to score programs. And you can actually see these lines coming through. This is why I found it fascinating doing part one of this and finding out what mine was going through the mind of the Elbagri. Because he was obviously looking well ahead. He wasn't looking at the current technology the way we as engineers do. Uh, a lot of the things that were proposed there were just to, to match the technology of the day. And it shows you the lengths we had to go to to try and match that technology. Whereas today, everything, let's face it, the cameras that are running in the back there are throwing the data in, into to flash memory. Who would have thought that was possible? <laughs> so, sorry, a different, totally different point. You mentioned it's the 30th year of the Society next, next year. year. Uh, there's a conference which we hope will happen in Glasgow called Histelcon, mm -hmm. Histelcon 2019, uh, somehow in the middle of next year, probably in Glasgow, probably at Strathclyde. It deals with really any historical themes, but one of the ideas is that the, the sort of main theme might be uh, old computers of various mm -hmm. kinds that have not been very well known and so on. So I just wondered whether you know there might be some linking together of well, things we, that you do. You're, you're talking to the right society here, not just myself, but the whole of the society. Yeah. Well, I'm so that's just the kind of thing that yes, we'd love to get involved with. Yeah. <laughs> and Thank you. It's going slightly off the piece, but to pick up on Dan's remark. The RAF Museum, won't, they time limit your ability to survey any aircraft in their collection that have luminous dials, which is mm. most aircraft which is a real pain if you're trying to restore something. Um, but many of us sit in those aeroplanes for hours at a time flying, and that's perfectly all right. The CA doesn't seem to have a problem. The RF does. Not the nightmare. And the issue with asbestos is a bit subtle. If you look at the regulations, um, provided the asbestos is not being moved or touched, it can be ignored. Mm -hmm. yeah. But as soon as you're in danger of moving it, mm -hmm. and of course if it's in valve seats, you are. That's when it becomes a hazard. So you have to be 
very careful when people throw the asbestos from that because they really know what they're talking about. Yes, and a lot of them don't. I mean, there's an example with Cavalier, the Second World War destroyer, which has asbestos cladding on all its steam pipes, which are covered in so much grey paint, you couldn't get at the asbestos. But the people who were in charge of it at one point said, oh, it has to be cleared out. So they got a firm in, and they cut off all the asbestos. When they came to the pipe hangers, they just cut down the side of the pipe hangers and left a disc of exposed asbestos <laughs> on each side. And the people who were responsible for the ship as a museum exhibit signed off on it. So when they actually came to really try and conserve the ship, they had to do it all again because the asbestos was exposed. Mm -hmm. But a, a point about Elliot's at that site in Lewisham um, is actually on a medieval mill site. There's been industry on that site until Elliot's left. It's now Tesco's car park. <laughs> I think that's super close. Do you want to talk about the program? Uh, well, I think much more important is to thank you and uh, Chris for a very interesting discussion and taking us through a considerable period, a, a considerable uh, time period. And it is the CCS's own history. <laughs> well, uh, something that I would, uh, since I'm now putting the program together for 2019, I, I would welcome thoughts on how we might mark our 30th anniversary uh, next year. I we need to agree when the 30th anniversary is. I shall go talk to Doran and so on and see uh, uh, exactly what it is and have a look at um, Resurrection uh, number one and see what it says. But uh, we, we do need to mark it, and I, I think uh, this is. Uh, a, a wonderful example of, of what has been achieved uh, on one project and when you think about all the other projects as well that uh, come in the CCS, uh, a great deal has been done. But can we today uh, thank uh, Rod and Chris for today's talk and also thank the whole of the working party, uh, all of those who contributed uh, to, to this fascinating story. Those of you who walk down the Strand will have seen the Union Jacks flying to celebrate the end of another CCS season. <laughs> We're not sure who organised it. We're trying to find out. But um, it was very kind of them. Um, I'm afraid this is the last uh, meeting uh, until the...